Greetings, greetings, welcome. I wanted to jump on and share an article with you real quick. I'll only be a few minutes talking about this. Every once in a while, I'll run across something that's really good in the sense of explaining these theories of Becker and Solomon Greenberg, Pazinski, these death anxiety, denial of death and terror management theories. And this happens to be an excellent one. So I wanted to share that with you. Um, I'm going to jump over here. I'm going to share my screen. It, uh, it's called Denying Mortality, Five Key Concepts by Ernest Becker. And you can find this on um, thecollector.com. And the author's name, I, I really can't pronounce, Claychon, Siajak, maybe, Siajak. Um, I'm not sure. I apologize for butchering his name. Um, I think it's uh, him, her, they. Um, and it just it's a good article, and I just wanted to go over it and share it with you. Uh, it says, Ernest Becker explores how man is conditioned by his own finitude and how he fights this limitation through heroism. Now, heroism is one of those difficult um, concepts in that there's a, not a whole lot of a talk of heroism in the worm at the core, which, which I'm reading on my YouTube channel now. And I hope you can join us uh, this weekend at Saturday's chapter 10. Um, it's about mental health and, and death anxiety, but they don't talk, they don't use the word heroism, but they explain it in a different way. But this is from Becker's perspective and heroism is, a really, I think, I think they don't use it. The authors of the worm, don't, they don't use it because it's a different. It's mistranslated in English. Hero, heroism, heroine. That that those are mistranslated into something bigger than they are. But let me go ahead and and go through this with you, and, and let's just talk about it a little bit. In his Pulitzer Prize winning book, The Denial of Death, Ernest Becker postulated that our social and cultural existence is based on avoiding our biological reality, on transcending it with symbols that can live long after we're gone. Central to his work are the notions of death, heroism, anality, transcendence, and the world as it is. These are the ideas we will explore in this article. These notions are all connected to each other and build on an inter interactive system in Becker's work. So right there, Fairly, fairly clearly stating the, our condition, our biological condition, is that we're alive. We want to stay alive. We have a disinclination to die. We, we want to survive. We want to have offspring, those kind of instinctual or built-in mechanisms. And that's in direct conflict with our knowledge that we're going to die. So th those two things are really at the core of this. So let's go through and look at uh, these, there's five of them. Ernest Becker on the notion of heroism. Becker makes an astonishing claim. All creatures and societies are symbolic fields, structures of roles and behavior, which serve as the background on top of which our inherent need for heroism can unfold. Through heroism, we deny death and our own impermanence. It allows us to transcend time and the fleeting nature of life. Quote, each cultural system is a dramatization of earthly heroics. Each system cuts out roles for performances of, of various degrees of heroism, from the high heroism of Churchill or a Mao or a Buddha to the low heroism of the coal miner, the peasant, the simple priest, the plain everyday earthly heroism wrought by gnarled working hands gu guiding a family through the hunger and disease. So he lays out there real simply that there are levels of heroism. And when we talk about heroism, we're talking about a person, every human being desiring to stand out, to be something special. You know, we want to find, be significant in a world of meaning. So we seek out these things in our culture that will act as a vehicle for heroism. We want, you know, Becker says, uh, special uh, cosmic specialness uh, be the one that stands out in nature. We all have a drive for this, and it's based on denying our mortality. 
The notion of the hero is the central mode of being in the world. The world is a theater of heroism where the actor tries to gain a feeling of unshakable meaningfulness, a notion of his own cosmic uniqueness. There, there, there's a different way to put it. Fundamentally, heroism is one of the only acts which reaches down into our human nature and brings it to life. This is because, according to Becker, it is based on narcissism, the child's need for self-esteem, the drive to be distinguished. Every society is structured like a religion. Even if it declares itself officially secular, the religion being that of heroism and self-transcendence, which permeates all of our aspirations with its confines. And that's another very true statement if you look at how our societies, our cultures are set up. They, they, they're driven by what's good, what's bad, what's, you know, what you'll be rewarded for, what you'll be punished for, those kinds of things. Becker argues that everything, our name, our ego, is given to us by signs outside of ourselves, by alien powers with which we identify and manufacture ourselves. This is why humans feel like they have no authority in the world. They're not brave. Heroism doesn't spring from genuine curiosity, but from a drive to conceal our own decaying, finite existence, to live forever amongst the, amongst symbols. So that, there's a desire. If you read The Worm at the Core, I think it's chapter six, symbolic um, immortality, and another chapter, literal mortality. Um, Talk, talking about the human desire for immortality. And you'll see this all through our culture as well. Cultures as an antidote to death. Heroism is nothing but the ver, uh, very negation of death. Heroism is nothing but the very negation of death, human mortality and biological limits. Man is split in two. He has a dreadful awareness of his uniqueness, which reaches toward the transcend transcendental, yet his feet stumble on the earthly ground, which will soon claim him. Footsteps erased by the passage of time. Man is a contradiction. We're the only animal burdened with the knowledge of its own finitude. We're crawling beings, gasping for air on top of a, a pile of corpses, tearing through the flesh of the other to fend off our inevitable annihilation for just a little bit longer. Heroism is the uh, symmetrical negation of death. The terror of death haunts our every living moment. We know that everything we do will be undone, and every step we take will be wiped out. The notion of anality expresses physical finitude, while death signifies our finitude in time. Trapped within the confines of space-time, man turns his head toward the sky, longing for ways in which his existence can, ma existence can manage to leave a mark after he is gone. Split into the symbolic and the material biological reality of its being, man uses the first to conceal the latter. Great buildings, history, culture, monuments, everything we do is to assure ourselves of our own non-temporality -tempora and spatiality. Our culture tells us that with the right act of heroism, our name will be crystallized in the flow of time, unmovable, forever displaying our unique existence. This explains our passionate protection of classic works of art, literature, or film. Number three, anality, the body, and decay. According to Becker, this dualism expressed most clearly in anality. The child first discovers through anality that the body has demands and functions that it needs to perform, regardless of whether he likes it or not. He learns that his body is a weird, strange creature that functions according to its own rules. He is estranged by it. His anus represents the fact that he is nothing but a body that tears and excrements worldly body bodies in order to keep itself alive. In the eyes of nature, he is not a self, but a thing. So there, he, Becker goes in deeply into this idea of denying our animality and anality. One of the big things, there's a, tri, a Chagas tribe, I believe in Brazil, if I'm not mistaken, that wears anal plugs to, to act, every day to act like they don't 
they don't have these bodily functions. And, and it's all in service of denying animality or denying that we're animals. The anus and its incomprehensible repulsive product re represents not only physical determinism but, and bound, boundness, but the fate as well of all that is physical, decay and death. That's the bottom line. That's what it represents. Becker gives some examples from Kubrick's movie to support his point. In 2001, a space odyssey, man leaps into space. Man, man's leap into space is closely related to our ape-like past and is accompanied by the music of Strauss. And in Clockwork Orange, the main character rapes and enacts violence while Beethoven plays in the background. All of our culture, all of our transcendental symbols serve precisely to consider our animality, to take us beyond it. So denying that we're animals, there's Beethoven playing and um, Strauss um, playing, those kinds of rising above, we're not animals, we're something special. Culture is a protest against natural reality, a denial of the human condition of death. Another example of this tendency can be seen in the myths that surround leading figures, such as the North Koreans authorities that claim that Kim Jong-un doesn't defecate or urinate. Our own excrements remind us from our fatal futility and fleetingness. We want to create an aura that transcends our biological limits. We need to be more than the to totality of our biological processes and chemical reactions. Again, trying to rise above that animal uh, nature. It would be unbearable to experience yourself in full constraints, caught in the net of time, unable to escape the flow of history. Man needs to rise above what he is. He needs to deny the physical. Faced with this fate, how could this animal survive if he did not invent the permanence of her the heroic? And that's what, that's what it serves, um, to, to deny that you're an animal, to deny that you're going to die. Number four, coping with the world as it is. The world as it is is too much for us to be able to cope with it. It tells no story, it makes no point, it has no balance, no symmetry, no narrative, no chronology. It signifies nothing. A tendency arises in us to cut back on life, to cut back in this intensity in order for us to be able to deal with it. By the time we leave childhood, Becker argues that we already have learned to conceal a raw reality through symbols that function like an airbag softening the brutal blow of reality. People often remember feeling everything with a higher intensity during their childhood. Due to repetition, one might get used to certain things which no longer invoke the same intensity. Becker tells us that this function is crucial to our own continued existence and is a coping mechanism developed through symbols rather than a natural function of the senses. We need to move through the world with a sense of detachment from it with a sense of direction that could be easily undermined if we allowed the world to come as it is. Quote, we can't keep gaping with our hearts in our mouths, greedily sucking up with our eyes everything great and powerful that strikes us. Animals are endowed with instincts that move them automatically in order to respond to outside stimuli. All else is ignored, or more precisely, not even perceived. They live in the silver slice of reality and occupy a territory of neurological and chemical reactions. Man, on the other hand, isn't confined to a territory within a slice of time. He lives everywhere all, at all times. He sees his body as a problem to be explained. He sees not only his material body this way, but his mental self as well. He is in, incompress, incompressibly, incompressible to himself. Why is he here? What is he supposed to do? The universe remains mute to these calls. Becker calls man a god with an anus, transcendent and stuck, limitless and bound, a walking contradiction. And finally, Becker, Ernest Becker on transcendence. Man is caught between the freedom of his ego and the fate of his body. There's a dissonance between man's ultimate unlimited energy and need for transcendence and the body's incapability of offering such transcendence. On some level, 
This is a universal experience. We try to transcend our bodies in all sorts of ways. One of the one way of striving for transcendence is through sex or masturbation, where it is achieved by making sexuality purely personal, controlling our body precisely to relieve it from determinism. Even if this doesn't always work, our biolog bi biology never fails to catch up with us. Schopenhauer called the post-orgasmic moment the devil's laughter. That's the moment when we realize that we have been deluding ourselves, that we are slaves to our own biological imperatives, which couldn't care less about our happiness <clears throat> or about our notions of transcendence. The body gives us the idea of a certain distance from it only for us to further propel its own goals. By attempting to negate the body, we simply end up affirming it even more. According to Becker, the way to achieve maturity is to sublimate the individual's way of transcending his own body into the rest of the social community. Freud asserts something similar. Man can paradoxically transcend himself by affirming his non-transcendence, by accepting the reality of his own condition as a biological entity. So that is a very good explanation of some of these ideas that Becker puts out. I mean, it's this, it's this author's own interpretation of, but, but to my mind, they're, they're, they're very accurate. And the bottom line is, is, is we're caught in the body. We have this wonderful mind, this big four brain that can think back 10,000 years and imagine things and keep think forward 10,000 years and imagine things makes it very powerful to uh, feel and understand our existence that way. So we know our body is decaying and dying and our mind wants to resist that. And it's our basically what uh, terror management does, or what d death anxiety is and death denial is, is not so much the fear of death, it's the knowledge of dying and the knowledge of impermanence and insignificance. And that's what we're most concerned with. And that's what drives us towards these cultural um, pursuits, wh whatever feeds it, your worldview to, to boost your self-esteem, basically, to bolster your self-esteem. Self-esteem acts as a, a buffer to death anxiety because it represses death anxiety. It builds you up, makes you feel that you're important and all the things you're doing are you know, critical and the business deal you're making and the artwork you're doing and all this stuff is top priority. And, and those are those are ways the malignant things are terrible that come out of that. And there's a lot of it that comes out as malignant acts uh, denying death. But those are ways that we were able to get up out of bed every morning and function every day. If we if we had to think about this, if this was on our in the forefront of our minds, if we didn't have these evolution, psychological evolutionary developments that that allow us to repress and tools to repress uh, this knowledge of our impending death, we would be curled up in the corner, as they say. So anyway, I wanted to share that. I hope you can um, join me Saturday for the 10th chapter in the book, The Worm at the Core. It's called Cracks in the Shield, and it's about the mental health issues. Uh, it's very interesting. Um, so if you can, it's 10, 10 o'clock Mountain Standard Time on Saturday. And we will be, um, let's see, we have one more chapter after this. So we have one more week, uh, the final chapter. And uh, we'll, we'll try to do a, a deep dive on some of that stuff and kind of go over the book. But I'll put out that announcement today. And um, I hope you enjoyed the article. I know I did. And we'll talk to you or we'll see you on Saturday. Have a great day. Stay safe. Be well. Bye-bye.